Hi there everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm the GCSE science teacher. In today's video, we're revising all the topic for GCSE physics paper one. I hope you find this video helpful. Let's get started. So the topic we're gonna talk about first is energy. And you need to know that energy is a quantity measured in joules. We cannot create or destroy energy. This is called law of conservation of energy. However, we can transfer energy from one store to another. The key energy stores you need to know include nuclear energy, which is stored in the nucleus of the atom, elastic potential, Central energy found in objects that can be stretched or squashed, kinetic energy which is stored in moving objects, chemical energy stored in chemical bonds, so batteries are a great example, we have magnetic light and sound which are all self-explanatory and we also have thermal energy and gravitational potential energy, so thermal energy in hot objects and gravitational potential energy when objects are at a height. You need to know how these energy stores are transferred. There's three specific ways. Mechanically, when work is done. Electrically, when moving charge does work. And also heating, when energy is transferred from hot to cold objects. Speaking of hot and cold, you need to know the definitions of conduction, convection, and radiation. Let's talk about those now. So conduction is heat transfer, which occurs between objects in direct contact. So metal objects are really good conductors of heat, whereas non-metals and also gases are usually poor conductors. These are often referred to as insulators. Convection is heat which is transferred within fluids like gases and liquids, whereas radiation is transferred through electromagnetic waves without involving particles. You need to know this links nicely to how we can have an efficient home in terms of heat transfer. So making sure the home is well heated and heat is not transferred to the surroundings. So having insulation, double glazing, cavity walls all reduce the convection and conduction of heat to the surroundings of the home. Speaking of heat as well, friction, which is a force measured in newtons, can actually cause devices to be less efficient. And to make sure they are efficient and re stop releasing heat thermal energy to the surroundings, we can add lubricants to them to actually prevent that dissipation and wasted energy. Speaking of efficiency, there are two equations. We have useful output energy transfer divided by total input energy transfer, or we could have efficiency equals useful power output divided by total power input. Power, there are two equations to know. So power is measured in watts and it can equal resistance in ohms times by the current in amps squared. We also could have power equaling voltage times uh, current. Remember that one of them has a square. It's really important to make sure you have the correct units in your answer as well. And if you type in your calculator, don't forget to write it as well. Energy sources, however, there are renewable energy sources and non-renewables. Let's talk about them together. So solar, biofuels, wind, tidal, wave, hydroelectric, geothermal, and nuclear are all examples of renewable energy. However, the fossil fuels that are non-renewable include coal, oil, and natural gas, and they contain that chemical energy when they are burned during combustion. You also need to know a few more equations for energy. So elastic potential energy is equal to a half times the spring constant K times the extension squared. You need to know gravitational potential energy is equal to the mass times gravitational field strength times height. And kinetic energy is equal to a half times the mass times the speed squared or velocity squared. Don't forget to put your units when you do your calculations. You could be asked to rearrange them to get the subject you are looking for. For as well. And then last of all, we have a required practical in energy called specific heat capacity. And this links to the next topic, which is electricity as well. However, you need to know the variables for this practical as with any of them. So an independent variable for this practical is the material used. We have a dependent a variable which is a specific heat capacity and the control variable something you keep the same which is the time taken the insulating layer and the initial temperature remember the equation for specific heat capacity is delta e or change in thermal energy equals the mass and this is times by specific heat capacity c times by the temperature change or delta theta remember the change or the delta is just how it's gone from the beginning to the end the initial to the final result
Electricity is a definite Marmite topic. You either love it or loathe it. Let me know in the comment section your preference. Either way, I hope you find this helpful. Three definitions you need to know to help you understand this topic further include current, voltage, and also resistance. Current is the flow of charge. That charge is the delocalized electrons that are found within the metal wire that conduct that electricity. Resistance is the opposition of this flow of charge, it's the opposition of current, and is measured in ohms. We also have voltage or potential difference, which is the push given to those electrons throughout the circuit. You can put this into an equation, V equals IR, and another equation, which is charge equals current times time. Now, we need to know there are two types of current. The first is called direct current and has a constant voltage. It flows in one direction. The car batteries and solar cells are examples of where you'd find direct current, and it's less efficient due to friction and heat transfer during electricity generation. Therefore, it's not used for the national grid, which needs to supply homes and therefore supply current through long distances. Alternating current or AC has current constantly changing direction. The power stations produce this type of current by using magnets. It's less expensive, it's easier to generate, and can be, as I said, transmitted across long distances, so less energy is wasted as it is transferred. Speaking of the national grid, remember this is composed of long transmission lines which have very high voltages, around 275,000 volts, and we only receive in the UK 230 volts due to step-down transformers. Step-up transformers are at the start of the national grid to increase that voltage to allow it to be transferred across. The frequency is also 50 hertz. In terms of plugs, you need to know of three key wires. The blue wire is the neutral wire and completes the circuit. The green and yellow stripe wire is the earth wire. This is a safety wire to stop the device becoming live. And the brown wire is the live wire. And this carries the alternating potential difference from the supply. You also need to know inside the plug, there is a fuse, which essentially is a safety feature. It melts and breaks the circuit if the current gets too high. Now, plugs are often part of a circuit and you need to know the different circuit symbols. So you need to know the definitions for each of them and what their functions are, but also identify them too. And these are often easy marks to get in the exam. A couple of key ones to identify here, just so you don't get mixed up. Cell and battery. A battery is made of more than one cell. We have an ammeter, which measures the current and a voltmeter that measures the potential difference. Remember to connect an ammeter in series and a voltmeter in parallel. We also have have a diode and a light emitting diode. Both of them only allow current to flow in one direction. And this links nicely to IV characteristics. So you need to know three different IV graphs. The first one we're going to talk about is the filament lamp. So this is the middle one. We have potential difference. You can see the circuit symbol for a filament lamp here or a bulb. And as you can see, this has a sigmoid curve. In a filament bulb, the current does not increase as fast as the potential difference. However, if we look at a a, another IV characteristic graph, we've got the diode. This only allows current to flow in one direction. If the potential difference is arranged to try and push the current the wrong way, also called reverse bias, the current will not flow. And you can see that that graph has a very flat line and then current flowing in one direction as you see here. We also have a fixed resistor. Again, the circuit symbol is shown there. And you can see it has a nice linear line through the origin. So for a fixed resistor, the potential difference is directly proportional to the current and therefore is considered an ohmic conductor. We also need to know about series and parallel circuits. Remember, a series circuit is one continuous loop of wire connecting all the components together, and the current is the same throughout the circuit. The potential difference, however, is shared. In a parallel circuit, you can see the components are connected in separate loops and branches, and the voltage is the same, but the current is shared. Now, you also need to know about a required practical which measures the resistance of a wire, and essentially what you're doing here is you are moving the length of wire and increasing the length each time and that essentially can be used to determine the resistance of that wire by using the equation V equals IR as we can record the voltage and also the current in this experiment. Lastly, you need to know about static electricity and a material that gains electrons can become negatively charged. The material that loses ele electrons is left with an equal positive charge. So things like cloths and plastic, if you rub them together, electrons are transferred onto one of those objects. And this is what we call static electricity.
In the particle model of matter topic, you need to know solids, liquids, and gases are the three states of matter. Solids have a regular arrangement where those particles will vibrate at fixed positions. Liquids and gases are what we call fluids, and they are able to flow over one another in their particle model. Liquids have a irregular arrangement as do gases. However, liquids will move slightly slower than gas would due to the amount of kinetic energy provided to those particles. The kinetic energy comes from the internal energy of those particular substances. So internal energy is based on the potential and kinetic energy. The kinetic energy specifically comes from the temperature increase that causes the solid to turn into a liquid to turn into a gas. So if we go from a solid to a liquid we call this melting a, a thermal energy is applied liquid to gas is called evaporation if we reverse this and go from a gas to a liquid we cool the substance down and condense it and if we cool it further we can freeze it into a solid now sublimation is a state change which skips the liquid state and this is much more rare in reality now, there are a couple of required practicals you need to know for this topic, but let's first of all talk about specific latent heat. Now, latent heat is the energy needed to change state of matter, and there are two types. We've got specific latent heat of fusion, when we have a, a solid turning into a liquid by melting. We also have specific latent heat of vaporization. So this is the change of state from a liquid to a vapor or a gas. Now, we can use the required practical specific latent heat of fusion of water to to investigate this further. And the aim of this practical was essentially to determine the amount of thermal energy that's needed to turn one kilogram of ice into one kilogram of liquid water at zero degrees Celsius. Remember that if there is a state change, the temperature does not change. And you can see that by looking at the heating and cooling curves. The heating and cooling curves essentially show us that there is a flat horizontal line when there is a state change. So that temperature does not change at all. But as the temperature does increase, or decrease. Um, essentially, those particles will gain internal energy and those kinetic energy uh, levels will rise and cause those particles to move more. We also have this idea of just gas motion in general and how this relates to pressure. So remember, pressure is equal to the force divided by area. So if you increase the amount of pressure, you must be applying a force in a reduced amount of area. We can also put this into the equation PV equals a constant. So pressure volume equals a constant or P1V1 equals P2V2. And remember, this is all due to the fact that gases are able to move around and they can collide with the walls of a container. And this again links this idea of kinetic energy that's stored within those particles. We also have another required practical that is not related necessarily to latent heat or gases, but this is more to do with density. So remember, density is the mass per unit volume. So how many particles are packed within a given volume of space? And remember, density is equal to the mass divided by the volume, as you can see in the equation there. Now, what you need to do for this required practical is there's two parts to it. So you could be expected to write a method for the density of an irregular object or a regular object. Regular objects, you simply use the equation and you work out the volume by measuring the height times length times width. However, if you have an irregular object, you would need to work out the displacement of water to work out your volume and then use the equation afterwards. So the next topic is atomic structure, and there is some overlap with GCSE chemistry, but interestingly enough, you can use that for the physics exam, that knowledge you've acquired. So let's remember that atoms are found everywhere and are made up of three subatomic particles. We've got protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons and neutrons have the majority of mass, and that is concentrated in the center of the atom, which is called the nucleus. They both have a mass of one, relative mass that is, because they're so small. Protons have a plus one charge, however, neutrons have no charge at all. Surrounding the nucleus is electron shells, and electrons are found within them in a 2A8 configuration. And electrons have a minus one charge and a mass of less than one, so they're much smaller than protons and neutrons. If we want to know how many protons and neutrons and electrons there are in an atom, we go to the periodic table and look for the mass number and the atomic number. The mass number tells us how many protons and neutrons there are, whereas the atomic number just tells us how many protons there are or how many electrons there are, as the number would be the same for both. If we want to work out the neutron number from this information, we just take the atomic number away from the mass number. So in the case of sodium, we would do 23 minus 11, which would give us an answer of 12 uh, neutrons. 
And we can also have different versions of atoms depending on how many neutrons there are. So different number of neutrons, but the same number of protons is a definition for the word isotope. In terms of isotopes, they can be unstable and this can lead to radiation being released. So we have three types. We have gamma, alpha and beta radiation. Remember that gamma radiation is an EM wave. So it's very penetrating. It's in fact the most penetrating. It's stopped by lead and concrete and is ionizing. Alpha is a helium nucleus. So it has a mass number of four and an atomic number of two. It's highly ionizing. It's least penetrating and is stopped by skin, paper and air. Beta radiation is a high speed electron. It's stopped by aluminium. It's ionizing. Its neutrons essentially turns into a proton and releases an electron during beta decay. Now, you need to know that beta also has an atomic number of minus one, but it doesn't have a mass number because it is an electron. You also need to know the equations and the radiation equations, the nuclear equations that go with each of these. And there's some examples here for you. Now, the history of the atom has changed over time, and you need to know the timeline. Starting off in the early 19th century, Dalton thought of atoms as solid spheres. But in 1897, J.J. Thomson changed this idea of the atom to the plum pudding model, where the majority of the atom was positively charged with electrons that were negatively charged and dotted within that structure. In 1909, Rutherford did his alpha scattering experiment, which told scientists and the world that the atom contained the majority of its mass in the center. In 1911, Bohr thought that electrons orbit in shells around the nucleus. And in 1940, Chadwick discovered the neutrons in the nucleus. Now we've talked about radiation, but there's this idea of irradiation and contamination. Essentially, this means that atoms that have the ability to release radioactive decay and radioactive substances, this can lead to health hazards and problems. And therefore, people who handle and use these radioactive substances need to protect themselves with lead lined aprons or place these objects in lead lined boxes. And this prevents the exposure. We can also use a Geiger counter to indicate how much exposure there is in a certain area. You also need to know, however, that certain medical uses um, do in fact use radiation like gamma to sterilize surgical equipment and also for radiotherapy as well. There's also this idea of half-life and this is the time taken for the number of radioactive nuclei to halve. So in the example here you can see that within a time of 10 days the radioactive nuclear has dropped from 80 to 40. So it has a half-life of 10 in this example. The curve that you see will always be the same in radioactive half-lives. So it's worth getting used to seeing those. You could be asked to interpret this graph, this sort of data, and also to give a definition for half-life too. And that's it from me today. I've been the GCSE science teacher and you have been curious. If you did enjoy this video, let me know by giving it a big thumbs up, share it with someone else so they don't miss out. And so you don't miss out, please click the bell so you get notified and subscribe to this amazing community. Can I just say thank you so much to everyone who has subscribed, shared these videos and also left really lovely comments. It's amazing to have so many wonderful people here. So thank you so much. And if you are studying your GCSEs, very best of luck to you. I hope the biology one went well let me know in the comments section I'll link for you the chemistry video that I made recently for your GCSE chemistry exam and also a playlist of all the physics paper one videos to help you out if you'd like to learn more about those individual topics I have talked about in this video in the meantime have a fantastic day take care see you in the next one